Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a Merwin and Holbert that's not actually a Merwin and Holbert. This is a Spanish copy manufactured by the company of Anichua y Chahola in, uh, well, between 1881 and 1897, so really a fairly long production time for something that a lot of people would probably just dismiss as a knockoff. Well, it's kind of interesting in that it is quite literally a knockoff of the original Merwin and Holbert design. Spanish patent law at this time had this interesting twist to it where you could only enforce a patent in Spain if you actually produced the thing in Spain. So in most countries, for example if Merwin and Holbert wanted to protect against, say, a German company manufacturing copies of their guns, they could file a patent in Germany, and thus they'd be the only people allowed to manufacture their guns in Germany whether they actually did so or not. In Spain, if you don't set up to produce it, tough cookies, your patent is unenforceable. Uh, and this was done to protect the Spanish arms industry, which did a lot of copying of other people's stuff. Well, Sharola Ianichua uh, took an extra step on this and they actually went and patented this system themselves in about 1881 or 1882. Basically when they started producing it, they patented it. They made, they didn't have to make any claim that they were the original inventors. There was no patent in Spain, so they filed one. And because they planned to actually manufacture them, their patent was enforceable where Merwin and Albert's patent would not have been. Uh, most people, by the way, didn't bother filing patents in Spain at all because what's the point? You're going to pay a lawyer and a licensing, you know, and a processing sort of fee, and you're not going to have anything of any legal use, so why bother? At any rate, this revolver would be really the mainstay of Anicho Ishirola's business for more than 15 years. They would produce some other guns, but this was the highlight, and uh, it was actually pretty good. So let me show you up close. I said that these guns were very high quality manufacture, and they were, not quite to the, the level of American Merwin and Hulberts, which were really exemplary when it came to manufacturing quality. Uh, however, this particular example, as with many of the surviving ones today, has seen a lot of long rough use, and it's worse for the wear today. So uh, I just want to point out, don't, don't judge the original production by the current state of this example. Now, Merwin and Hulbert made these guns uh, with both open frame and closed frame designs, and I don't have a closed frame Merwin and Hulbert to show you, uh, but that's what this is duplicating, and it does a quite good job of it. Now the interesting and unique feature about the Merwin and Hulbert is it has a loading gate here for loading, but then to unload the gun you actually push this lever backwards, and then you have to put the hammer at half cock, this one um, <laughs> The, the hammer is well and truly worn out, so I have to hold this back manually. But uh, you rotate the barrel and cylinder assembly and then pull it forward like this. The cartridge rims stick under uh, this ring, and so what it does is pull out the empty cases, which then fall out of the gun. Uh, live cartridges, let's see, once again this is worse for the wear. Uh, when you pull this to full extension here, a live cartridge that still has a bullet in it is long enough that it actually stays in the gun and doesn't get dropped out. So we have some rings in here to uh, to give space for black powder fouling. Uh, once you've popped this open and dumped the empties out, you then close it like so, open the loading gate, and you can reload it one round at a time. American Merwin and Hulberts were primarily made in uh, 44 Winchester Centerfire or 4440 caliber. These, uh, being made with the intention of selling to the Spanish military, were in uh, 44 Smith and Wesson American, uh, which was already in use uh, in Spain. We have a couple markings here that you can see. Uh, on the side of the barrel, we have the manufacturer marks. So they didn't try and say this was a Smith and Wesson. Uh, it is marked Fabrica de Anichua y Charola, España Ebar. By the way, uh, the company was founded in 1880 or 1881 and it would last until 1899, although at the very end of its existence the name actually swapped and it became Sharola Ianichua, um, which I have a, 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 another video already out there on one of their semi-auto pistols that was done after that time, 
which is Sharola and Anichua. This one, being earlier, is Anichua e Sharola. The top of the barrel is marked Sistema Merwin. So again, they actually acknowledged where this came from. Uh, Reformado e Privil Privilegiado, uh, which I believe in signifies that they have improved and patented the design. What exactly they did to improve it, I'm really not sure. The grips are unique to Sharola, um, in particular this checkerboard. You'll actually see that on grips from some other um, A-bar region pistols as well. But uh, that's, that's probably the easiest way to distinguish these at a glance, at a distance, from uh, American Merwin and Halberts is the grip design. One interesting feature I want to point out on this particular example is it appears to have been cut for a shoulder stock. Now I haven't seen that on American Merwins. In fact, I haven't seen that on any of them, Spanish or American, but that appears to be what's been done to this particular one. And that's not completely out of character for the time period. Um, several of the later Spanish military pistols would be often um, set up with shoulder stocks. There were, of course, Colt percussion revolvers at the time that were also offered with shoulder stock options. So yeah, it's a, a neat little unique feature to this one. I don't see exactly how the stock would have been attached. Normally you'd have a lug that went in here and then probably a screw that would tighten down against the bottom of the grip. There isn't any um, you know, deformation or marking to the finish that would suggest a lot of that was done. That little mark there is from the lanyard loop that rubs right there. So it's possible that this was sold with a shoulder stock or sold cut for a shoulder stock, but never actually had one uh, attached to it. The patent story kind of gets even funnier. Uh, another Spanish arms maker, Orbea Hermanos, uh, started making their own copy of the Merwin and Hulbert in 1884, and they were promptly sued by Anicho y Sharola for patent infringement. And Anicho y Sharola won, which was really kind of embarrassing to Orbea, who was one of the, the larger gun manufacturers in Spain. And they went and countersued in 1885, claiming that they'd actually been making this before Anichua and Shirola patented it. And they won that case as well. But by this point, the patent was just about expired, and so it kind of didn't matter anymore anyway. Now, Anichua and Shirola had attempted to get this revolver purchased in substantial quantities by the Spanish military, and they lost out actually to Orbea. Orbea was also making basically a copy of a Smith & Wesson double action top break revolver in 44 caliber. And in 1884, that was formally recommended by the government. Uh, not like technically issued, but you have to get your own handguns, officers, and we recommend this one. That naturally led to a lot of business for Orbea. Uh, Anichua Ishirola did manage in 1888 to get a similar recommendation for their Merwin and Hulbert copy, uh, but it just never did get the, the popularity of the Smith & Wesson copy from Orbea. So uh, there aren't very many of these guns around. Uh, there are probably more than people recognize because there are probably some of them that are just mistaken or assumed to be Merwin and Hulberts. But I think they're pretty cool. Uh, a really interesting reflection on what Spain was doing, uh, what Spain's arms industry was doing in the decades before it would really explode with World War I production. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.